Hello, everyone. Today we're talking about numbers. So as was mentioned, my name is Joel Kenville. And for all of you Chicago locals, or maybe Chicago fans, uh, I think I need to be honest here, and I need to answer a question that's probably top of your minds. The question is, does Coach Q write Elm? <laughs> Now, there have been rumors on the internet of a secret dev career, uh, and I can neither confirm nor deny those. Uh, but I'll leave you with this photo <laughs> and let you decide the truth for yourselves. So in September of 1999, the Mars Climate Orbiter completed its 266-day journey to Mars. And when I say completed, I mean it crashed into the Martian surface and burned up. <laughs> We lost $300 million project and several years of development, gone. So what happened? According to the investigation report, the root cause was a failure to use metric units in the coding of a trajectory model. Every other subsystem in this project used metric, but the trajectory calculator used American units. To quote the, the report again, the navigation software algorithm therefore underestimated the effect of the spacecraft trajectory by a factor of 4.45. An erroneous trajectory was computed using this incorrect data. So it's an incredibly expensive mistake to make, but it's also a terribly simple one. Now today you might see this and say, well, I don't build spacecraft. <laughs> I'm not in danger of making this kind of error. But I'd like to challenge you that we make these kinds of mistakes all the time. As developers, and particularly on the web, we have a culture of playing fast and loose with numbers. And we tend to make the following three mistakes all over our code. These are argument error orders, unit conversion uh, errors, and invalid operations. We make them over and over again and I'm sure you've done them at least a few times in your career. Let's look at them in a few, uh, at a few of these in more detail. Starting with argument order errors, which are probably the simplest. If we start with a function uh, like this, where we're calculating the speed of a particular object, uh, and we just need to know uh, the distance it traveled and how much time. Now, when we want to actually call it, uh, we say, OK, our distance is 10, our time is 5. Uh, but we forget, is it what order the arguments go to the speed function? Is it distance, then time, or time, and then distance? If we pick the wrong one, the program will still work, but we'll get a wrong answer. We might possibly even get one that's off by a factor of, say, 4.45. <laughs> This is a really easy mistake to make. So how can we make fewer of these mistakes? The answer is to get better at communication. If you're given a function signature that looks like this, what does this function signature tell us? I look at this and I see, here's a float, there's a float, everywhere there's a float. <laughs> <laughs> this old McDonald's farm here, but I'm not seeing anything very helpful. So as authors, it's important to ask ourselves, what do these numbers represent? And then communicate those answers to, those, to our readers. Now in the signature we were looking, each of those values is a fundamentally different quantity. So what if we communicated that with a signature that looks kind of like this? It takes in some meters and some seconds, and we get back meters per second. This tells a much better story. So how can we get there? Your first thought might be, oh, type aliases. That's a, a good fix. Type aliases are great because they're simple, and they give us a way to provide an alternate name for existing types. The problem with type aliases is that the compiler can't tell the difference between float, 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 and meter, second, meter per second. This is because Type aliases are for humans only. And humans aren't the only part of the equation when writing code. Last year, during an interview, I was asked to describe the experience of writing Elm. I said something like this. 
The Elm compiler has my back when I make a dumb mistake. It brings joy into front-end programming. So what if the compiler could help us to prevent us from making some of these mistakes? Well, just like when we want humans to help us uh, and for a human relationship, it's important to have some good communication. Now with humans, we communicate via uh, verbal words, we might communicate via text, uh, but with the Elm compiler, we communicate via types. So we might create some custom types here uh, and say we have meters, seconds, and meters per second. Uh, and these just wrap floats, but they're their own standalone types. It's important to remember that we can't do math directly on these because they're not numbers. That's kind of the whole point of what we're doing here. So we'll need to change the body of our function. Now we still have our function here, speed meters to second to meters per second. But notice that we have to unwrap the meters in second, do the division, and then rewrap them in meters per second. Now this might seem really annoying, and it kind of is, but it turns out you only have to do this in a few places. Most of the time when you're dealing with units, you're just passing values through or handing them over to a few special helper functions. So now that we have this, let's try to break it. So we've got our same code that we had before, uh, and we have our distance is in 10 meters, and our time is five seconds. Notice that we've both wrapped them. But now, uh, when we try to call it with the wrong argument order, we get a nice compiler error that tells us that we gave the first argument as a value in seconds, but it needs to be a value in meters. So we have success. <clears throat> That's a pretty easy fix to argument order errors. What about unit conversions? This is the kind of error that we saw with the Mars Climate Orbiter. Let's look at a simpler solution, or a simpler problem. We have 40 minutes and two hours and want to add the two together. If we do the naive thing and say 40 plus two, we're gonna get 42 back. And while that may be the answer to life, the universe, and everything, <laughs> it is not the right answer here. We really want to return either 160 minutes or 2.67 hours. Well, can the compiler help us here? Yes, but as before, we need to communicate. <clears throat> so what might that look like? Maybe a custom type and a add function, kind of like we did before. So we'd say uh, we add minutes and hours and get back. Hmm, what do we want to get back there? Is it hours? Is it minutes? And actually, the more we think about it, we've got a bit of combinatorial explosion going on here. What if we want to add minutes and minutes, or hours and hours? It's starting to feel a little <laughs> not so great. So let's take a step back and ask ourselves, what kind of quantities do these numbers represent? So in the previous example, we saw that meters and seconds represented entirely different quantities, so we created different types for them. But in the current example, hours and minutes are just variations on the same quantity. So what if we had them share a type? We could say we create a custom add function and says it must be a time and another time, and we get another time back. But now we still run into the conversion problem. And for this, we can use opaque types. Uh, we've already seen them come up a few times uh, today, uh, particularly in Richard's talk this morning. But the idea behind an opaque type is that we create a module and the time type lives inside of it, but we only expose the time type, not the constructor. So outside of this type, uh, outside of this module, it is not possible to construct uh, a time instance. We're gonna to need to actually create some values of type time, and so we can create our own uh, constructors here from minutes. Uh, we've decided to store the time in minutes, so we just wrap it inside of our time type. But what about from hours? You notice here that we're doing the conversion here, multiplying it by 60. And then finally, we do the addition. Again, where it's a little bit annoying to do the unwrap, rewrap thing, but it's the only place that we have to do it. 
And then if we wanted some convenience to get it back out to a float, we can create uh, some functions for that as well. Going back to our original problem, uh, we can see that we now create time from minutes 40 and time from hours 2. And now if we add the two together, we're going to get this time value time 160. Uh, but remember, it's an opaque type. So if we want to get it in minutes or in hours, we can use the helper functions and it will do the conversions for us. The value of using this approach is that all of our unit conversions now happen automatically. We don't need to think about them. And we have a single point of failure, um, which means that as shown earlier this morning, we can write a fuzz test around uh, our couple constructors and guarantee that anytime we create a time from an hour or minutes or milliseconds or any time unit, we're guaranteed to do the correct conversion. Now, L19 introduced a POSIX type. Uh, previously, time was just represented as a float. And uh, this is, follows a very similar idea to uh, the type that I just showed. Um, we don't really know whether under the hood it stores time as seconds or milliseconds. And honestly, it doesn't matter because uh, we just do the conversions in and out when we want to get our values. So that was pretty straightforward. Let's look at a slightly more complex example, money. So we have five US dollars and 10 euros, and we want to add the two together. And 15 is definitely not the right answer here. <laughs> uh, but the correct answer, it really depends. It depends on the day, it depends on the exchange rate. So we can't, the, the answer is not quite as simple as it first seems. So if we ask ourselves, again, the question, what kind of quantities do these numbers represent? US dollars and euros are similar. They both represent amounts of value, but they're different in subtle ways. If we think about the rules of what kind of operations we want to do, uh, we want to say that we can only add two currencies of the same type. But it's possible to convert between two currencies if you have the conversion rate between the two. So following the technique that we saw earlier, let's try to do this with two opaque types. We might create a US dollar module that has a custom US dollar type, and we add, create a function that adds US dollars together and a function that can convert to euros, given an exchange rate. Now, we also have to do the same in the other direction for euros. So we create a custom type for euros and a way to add euros together and convert to US dollars. And I think we have success here. Uh, we have now a way to uh, load 500 US dollar, or 500 cents, so five US dollars and 10 euros. And then we can first convert the euros to US dollars at a rate of 1.14 and finally add that to the US dollars and get back the correct number of uh, $16.40 US. So problem solved, right? Well, not quite. Because now we introduce a new currency. We want to handle yen. And now we have to create a custom module for yen that has a function to add yen to yen, but also to convert to US dollars and convert to euros and while we're at it, euros should be able to convert to yen and also US dollars to yen. And now we're back to combinatorial explosion. That makes me feel, hmm, not so good. So let's step back and think about what we want. We would like to be able to implement adding only a single time and implement conversion only a single time, regardless of the currency we're working with. At the same time, Remember our original rules. We can only add currencies of the same type, but we can convert between two currencies given a rate. So how can we satisfy all of this? And can the compiler help us here? The answer is yes, but we need to communicate. <laughs> so what about a uh, signature that looks kind of like this? So now we're getting fancy with our types, and we have these type variables. So we say when we add a currency, it has to be a currency. It can be any type of currency. Uh, that's that letter A. Um, but when we add the second currency, it must be of the same type. So it can be any two types as long as they're the same. 
and they're going to give us back a new currency of the same type. But if we convert, as long as we have a conversion rate from a particular currency to another currency, then we can convert a value of our original currency to whatever our destination currency is. This is going to make, uh, take advantage of a, a advanced type technique called phantom types uh, that are really cool and you don't need to use most of the time in your own programs. So don't go out and like do everything with phantom types, but uh, this is a nice solution here. Phantom types are particularly useful when you want to tell the compiler that two things are different while at the same time sharing an implementation. So here's what currency might look like. Uh, we have at the bottom is probably the most important, our currency type that has a type variable, A. And notice that we don't use it in the data part where we say it's currency wrapping a float and we just totally ignore the A. And that's where the name phantom comes from because the A just isn't used. Um, and then we've created a couple of just unit types up at the top that just say we have a thing called a US dollar, a thing called a euro, a thing called a yen, and we don't particularly care about uh, the details there. And then here's what adding would look like. So we have the same signature we saw earlier, and now we unwrap a currency. Remember, a currency just wraps a float. We add the two numbers and rewrap again. But wait a minute. Don't we need to care about what the, what the currency type is? The answer is no. And that's the beautiful part about phantom types. Our implementation here does not care whether you're adding yen or adding US dollars, but the way we've lined up the type signature up top, the compiler will check that and tell you you're not allowed to sum two currencies of different types. Let's see it in action. Uh, here we create, uh, again, US dollars and euros. And notice that now I've added a type signature above them. Because now I want to tell the compiler specifically, even though the wrapper doesn't know, I want you to know I've tagged this. This is of type euro or type US dollar. And when we try to add the two, sure enough, we get an error that tells us that the second argument to add is not what we expect. We should be adding two US dollars, but we're adding US dollars and euros. So I think we've successfully communicated. Constraint has been enforced. Now let's get really fancy. Uh, we talked about conversion, and so now we're doing a phantom type again, but we have two type variables. Again, we ignore them, but it's so they can keep track of what your origin currency is and your destination currency are. And again, if we look at the uh, convert function, you'll notice that we don't care at all in the implementation what the origin and destination currencies are. We just take a float, which is a rate, and multiply it times a uh, currency amount and rewrap them. And again, we can see it here in action. Uh, if we create a conversion rate of 1.12, and we again tell the compiler via the type signature, this is a conversion rate from euros into US dollars. And now if we take our euro and pipe it to convert at a particular rate, and type it back into add US dollars, we correctly get the answer. And it handled it all for us. Finally, if we wanted to go all the way, uh, we could combine those two functions together to say, oh, if I want to add two different currencies together, I can have currency A, uh, a conversion rate that goes from that original currency to another currency, uh, whatever the destination currency is, and then the total is just going to come back in my destination currency. So absolute fanciness, but we know that we're going to get the right answer because we've communicated our constraints to the compiler. And the compiler is a good friend. It has our back. So we've solved unit conversion errors. Great. What about invalid operations? These are a little bit trickier. They're more nebulous class of mistake. Um, because sometimes some operations make no sense in your domain. Here's an example. We're trying to calculate the total uh, for uh, a shopping cart. And so we take the subtotal and a tax. And there's a bug here. If you look at the implementation here, I'm multiplying the subtotal by the tax. And that's probably not what I should be doing here. Again, if we're trying to communicate both to humans and to the compiler, um, we should probably add some more descriptive types. 
And so here's what the types would actually look like. We take two dollar amounts, we multiply them together, and we get back dollars squared. I don't know about you, but I've never gone to a store and paid in dollars squared. <laughs> so this is kind of a nonsensical operation. And what it's telling me, and it's communicating to me as a programmer, is that multiplying dollars times dollars is probably not an operation that I need to be doing in this system. The result here just it doesn't make sense. And so it's important for me to ask myself every time I write what the unit of a type is, uh, what does this number represent? And does that representation make sense in my system? Now I'd say when you're creating some of these custom types, don't go out and try to implement every math function. Uh, if you're creating a dollar type and you're like, oh, I'll implement addition and subtraction and multiplication and division. Uh, but some of those don't make sense in your domain. As we saw, probably doesn't make sense to multiply dollars and dollars in your system. There's this great quote that says, no code has no bugs. And there are two ways to interpret this. And I love it both ways. They're both correct. <laughs> but it's true. And when we think about the units of our uh, software, they can guide us on what code not to write. In this case, multiplication on dollars. But things can get a little bit subtle. Uh, so let's look at a case study here. I did a project for MIT, and they were uh, displaying a lot of data, uh, time series data. And most of it was time stamped based off of a uh, Unix timestamp pretty standard uh, thing. But there was also an associated video. And some events were relative to the start of the video. So now I had a bunch of timestamps, but they weren't actually all the same kind of timestamp. And so initially, I was just representing them all as floats or thinking of them all as times. But actually, even though they actually all are times, what a time means in different contexts is slightly different. So I ended up realizing that I had three different entities in my system. I had good old Unix timestamps. We all know these. These are a number of milliseconds from 1970. But I also had video timestamps. So these were, again, a number of milliseconds, but not from 1970, but from the start of the video, which who knows when the start of the video is. And finally, I actually had a number that would tell me when did the video start uh, to convert back and forth uh, between the Unix timestamp and a video timestamp. Now, this all started with floats and then eventually uh, with one time type wrapping everything. But I kept running into bugs around this. And so it's very easy to add uh, better types gradually uh, to this kind of situation. Because if you create, say, a video time type uh, and introduce it in a single place, the compiler will tell you when you pass it as an argument to somewhere else, oh, you also need to add it here. You also need to add it here. And it won't find all the places, because not everything is a tree going out from where you initially added it. But it'll fix some of them. And later on, if you're fixing a bug or you encounter some code, and you're like, oh, this float here, this time here, should really be a video time go ahead and change that. And so now we have a refactoring that's viral and that will take over your code in a, in a good way over time, almost automatically, with almost zero effort on your part. And so it's very easy to introduce this uh, gradually, and you don't have to do it all up front. Here I've got a conversion function uh, given a time uh, that's in, or given a video epoch to know when the video started. And a video time and a Unix time, I can convert between the two. And as mentioned, we can uh, gradually uh, add these. I had another similar situation uh, when I was working on a game jam project. Uh, I did a few of these as side projects. I got involved in several game jams, uh, which are a lot of fun. And I was really excited to see uh, the game demo this morning, uh, the talk. That was really cool. But one of the things that you end up doing in game development is you have multiple coordinate spaces. Uh, typically, you'll have something called world space, which handles all of your, uh, 
all of your entities, how they are relative to some fixed point in your world. But you also have a screen space, which is like a particular pixel is at this location relative to the screen. And those two don't 100% line up. For example, some of the world might be off screen. Uh, if your game allows uh, zooming or panning, uh, this is always going to be the screen does not line up with the game one to one. And so if you have uh, a point type, which is a point in space, uh, a point doesn't always equal another point, and you can't always do operations between the two. Because sometimes a point is in world space, and sometimes a point is in screen space. The two different coordinate systems also end up using different units. So pixels are usually used for the screen space, but you might have some other world unit. Uh, maybe it's just feet, or maybe it's some fun made up unit for, that fits the theme of your world. So you've got a pirate theme game and you use leagues uh, for your, your game unit type. Doesn't matter, but the idea is you need to convert between the two and you need to be able to distinguish where an XY point and an XY point are not the same. And so it's important to ask yourself the question, again, what does this unit represent and is there any subtle differences that I need to be aware of? And here the simplest solution is to wrap them in a type. So we have a point, sometimes it's useful to wrap our custom type in yet another type to introduce another level of uh, distinctiveness between different units. And here's a viewport uh, just showing that we can convert between uh, world space and game, or world space and screen space uh, given that. So today we've seen three kinds of mistakes uh, that we can make uh, with units. So we've seen argument order mistakes, uh, unit conversion mistakes, and invalid operations. We found solutions to all of them, and in fact, it's really one solution. Communicate. Your friendly neighborhood compiler is just begging to help you, but you need to communicate. And every time you're dealing with units, ask yourself, what does this quantity represent? And use the types to represent that. We can enforce constraints with opaque types, add fuss testing, we can share implementations with phantom types, which is an advanced technique that we saw. And then finally, if you're really going deep into the units world, uh, Ian McKenzie's made this great library uh, called Elm Units, and it does a lot of, uh, it gives you built-in uh, units for all of the physical quantities and handles a bunch of the unit composition uh, for you. So if you're getting those, uh, things like seconds squared or meters over seconds, it handles that for you. Finally, if you want to get inspired, I recommend just checking out what F Sharp does with units of measure. It's really cool. Uh, they handle a lot of this stuff automatically for you, and so that is a great inspiration as well. And finally, I wish all of you, that all of your orbiters successfully make it to Mars. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>